listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, PJ team leader, jujitsu lover, meme enthusiast, and dad joke aficionado, Aaron Love. All right, everybody, what's, what's up? Welcome back to the Ones Ready Podcast here in the team room. We got a big one for you. Sean Buck Rogers from the FNG Academy is going to sit down and he's going to talk all things Army Special Forces. Do you have questions about what soft you want to go into? Do you, are you trying to figure out your best path? Well, in true Ones Ready fashion, we brought on the subject matter expert and we're going to get into a deep dive. As always, we want to start off with gratitude, say thanks for everybody subscribing, going to the YouTube channel, commenting, liking, sharing, getting the word out there that we are the premier aspect war entity out there, getting you the best information that you can possibly get to make your choice to get into one of these careers and earn each breath. Christmas is coming up. I hope you guys have gone to the Ones Ready Partner page and checked out our partners and affiliates. Again, we're not profiting from it directly, but there are a bunch of companies that we like, that we support, that we all personally use. Go over to onesready.com slash partners, and you will be able to get a sweet discount if you just use the Ones Ready code at every single checkout. So get yourself that sweet Everly stock bag. Get yourself some PJ locks from Outer Eggs Pomade. Get that new Alpha Brew mushroom hitter coffee that's just about to be released. Keep your eye out for that one. Alphabrew.com. Uh, everywhere again, code one's ready. All right. Out of the way. Sean Buck Rogers from the FNG Academy. What's up, man? Thanks for coming on. What's up, man? Thanks for having me, dude. Appreciate yeah, it. no problem, man. Big fan of your project. This was obviously, you know, we we're kind of swimming in the same circles here and, and we're going to get into where the FNG Academy came up with and, and all that other stuff. But just for our listeners that might not know you, just tell us a little about a uh, little bit about yourself, a little bit about your service. Yeah, so it was a uh, 10 Special Forces. Um, I did eight, was it eight and a half years uh, in the Army. I did a year in 19th Group in Guard as a selection cadre. Um and then I got out of the military, went law enforcement, got on a special team, um, citywide impact team going after, you know, uh, gangsters and, and getting guns off the streets and getting drugs off the streets. Um, and then recently, you know, thanks to recent events in our <laughs> political environment, decided that wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah, and I uh, can't, can't blame you. That's a, that's a rough gig to be living in right now. Yeah. Like, you really got to be you really got to be uh, sold into that. So. Right. And those, those, I mean, I feel terrible for cops right now. They're just getting, they're getting the shit out of the stick, like worse than anyone could possibly imagine. I mean, you're, you're, they're risking going to jail every day they go to work. Um, and everyone's out to just prove that, you know, that they're racist or that, you know, it's just, it's just terrible position, but someone's got to do it. So grateful for those guys that do choose to do it every day. Um, but it, I just knew that with my background and, and, you know, PTSD and, being in war and that's kind of temperament that I have, like I was pushing my luck and it was getting to the point where I was going to uh, get myself in trouble. So I got out and, you know, I was been working on a book for a couple of years, uh, rising above and it comes out in February. And I thought, you know what, like, what if I could have a career just helping guys, you know, and yeah, um, exactly. that's kind of how FNG Academy started coming about. I was like, well, if I'm going to help people, then at least I need to start at least like where they're going to listen to the things I have to say. Right. So what better way to, to talk about um, becoming special forces and, you know, helping the next generation of uh, Green Berets, you know, make better decisions, mm -hmm. which is exactly like you talked about in your intro is like we're here to help people choose the right career path. So they do. We do get the right people taking our spots. Right. Yeah, exactly. And that that's awesome. But before we get into all that, let's go back to the very basics. We're talking about special forces. And I'm going to kind of ask my own question here that's not on the paper. And it's kind of like a pet peeve of mine, even though I'm not a Green Beret. But can you explain the difference between special forces and special operations and why they're not interchangeable? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I just did a video on uh, Ranger Scrolls and Ranger Tabs. And it's like, dude, even the dudes in the Army like still can't get that right. But yeah, special <laughs> operations is, I mean, that's a, that's a whole slew of brothers that, you know, operate in so many different environments and so many different uh, capacities and they have, each has their own chunk of the pie. Special forces is talking about, you know, Green Berets. That's just one, 
job, you know, so special operations. I mean, that includes like you guys, CCTs, PJs, uh, Rangers, Green Berets that like there's someone for every job out there. And that umbrella is special operations. And those are the guys that are out there getting after it. And they're the tips of the spears. Yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to throw hate at all the civilians out there because, you know, it's, it's a little, uh, I, I can get why it's difficult, you know, because special forces sounds like an overarching umbrella term, right. uh, but it is not. Special forces are Green Berets and, and that's it. But um, let's talk about, uh, so what is the difference, uh, especially from where you're sitting? You know, we're Air Force guys, you're Army Green Beret. Uh, what are the differences between uh, Green Berets and Air Force uh, Special Tactics, Guardian Angel, you know, what we well, do? Well, honestly, I just did a video on CCTs and it was like, my time with CCTs was incredible like watching them work was amazing and i said it flat out like if i had to pick a special operations path now that i've been in special operations and now i have some experience with it you know some combat deployments all day long i would pick cct and the reason for that is because like for example one of the things i talked about is we're having team drama you know my team starts losing his mind we're doing just just bullshit honestly and the CCT is like, well, I'm out. So you guys have fun with that drama. I'm going to go <laughs> do some CCT stuff by myself and let me know when it's over and I'll be back in. If you need me, I'm going to be over here in the corner minding my right. own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like his boss wasn't, he's by himself. Like he's part of our team, but he's by himself and he gets to peace out whenever he wants. He gets to come in and tap in, you know, when the, the getting's good and, you know, we're, we're killing bad guys. And, you know, they're running and gunning hard, man. Not only are running and gunning, but they're calling in bombs all day and all night. Like, I've watched CCTs just, like, stare at the ground, like, legit seeing things and be like, Buck, you see that? I'm like, no, dude. He's like, look, it's on the ground. Look at it go. He's like, what is it doing? And I was like, dude, you got to sleep. And he's like, he's like, I'll <laughs> dude, sleep when to, we get back. You need to, you need <laughs> to take a knee face out and drink yeah. some water, playboy. Yeah, it's a tough job. So yeah, so speaking of, of of the different mission sets, though, so what what is a Green Beret mate or Green Beret team, a Special Forces team? What is the mission of that team? What are they designed to do? Yeah, so the a Green Beret's job is to go and train, advise, and assist. So they call us force multipliers. So our goal is not to kick down doors. Like we cross pollinate, you know, a lot with a lot of different special operations, like people get confused on Rangers and Green Brace. Like, well, which one's kicking in doors? It's like, well, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a Ranger's job is to kick in doors. That's his, that's his title. You know, that's what they're designed to do. But a Green Beret, um, we're there to train the, like a host party. So for us, it was the Afghan special operations guys. It's like, these guys don't know how to, uh, shoot, move, and communicate effectively enough to be on their own. So we need to teach them how to do that. We don't want to be in Afghanistan fighting their wars for them indefinitely. So what is the answer to that? Well, you send in some Green Berets. You teach them how to do what you do to an extent. Obviously, we're not teaching them everything, right? They couldn't even handle that because they're honestly just at, you know trying to get the base level down. Even their special operations guys are trying to get our base tactics down but we're trying to teach them just that base level tactics so at one point we could back out of that country and let them operate on their own and conduct missions on their own and be successful uh you know you know without having us with them all the time yeah i think that's the that's sorry that's right um so that's one of the things that i think a lot of people don't really realize what you're talking about right there is the train advise assist um, portion of the Green Berets. So I think, you know, like Trent was talking about, they see all kind of special operations like, oh, you're special operations. You do all the same things that a PJ or whoever does. And they don't know the backside of, obviously, there, there wouldn't be a purpose to having all these different career fields if they do the exact same thing. So, you know, coming from the outside, you mentioned like wanting to go into combat control or something if you had the, for, the hindsight kind of and knew what was going on in the battlefield. What made you go into Army Special Forces in the first place? And how did you hear about, you know, Green Berets? So when I went in, I wanted to be a Ranger. And honestly, I didn't know anything about the military. I didn't know anything. Uh, it's really all marketing. You know, when you're 
sitting in the civilian seat and you're like, well, this is a cool job. It's like, well, how do you know? I didn't know anyone in the military. I mean, my grandpa served in the Korean War, but he never talked about it. He was in the Air Force. And honestly, I, he's passed now and I still don't know what he did. Um, so I didn't know anything. All I knew was like, well, I want to get after it. And I know Rangers get after it. It's like, because I guess from movies, you know, you just watch movies and you're like, those guys are cool. So I walked in and, um, you know, the night before I ended up getting kicked out of EMT school because I was going to be a firefighter. And, um, you know, I got in a fight with this kid and I head butted him and they kicked me out of school. Well, yeah, that's, that's frowned upon. Usually yeah. head butting somebody, you know, in right. some circles, in some circles. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it happens. Uh, I mean, sometimes they ask for it, you know, well, <laughs> he, he was, he was actually picking a fight with the guy that I got to ride with this is like this tiny little skateboarder kid. And so I ended up, he ended up getting in my face and I hit, I hit him with, you know, headbutt him in the nose. And then she was like, well, cause both of us said, we're like, well, nothing happened. We were just messing around and it was an accident. And she's like, well, it's still under investigation for longer than you're allowed to be out. So take that hint and run with that. And I was like, well, thank you for kicking me out. Rightfully so, Ray. I wasn't like blaming her. Like I earned that one, you know. But the next day I just walked into the recruiter's office and was like, I'd like to be a ranger, please. And he was like, all right, come back tomorrow. And he's like, oh, this guy's an idiot. Um, so I went, he ended up not having a infantry ranger slot. So when I went in, he was like, I got some good news and bad news. And I was like, all right, what's that? I was like, is it Ranger? And he's like, oh, yeah, I got you, Ranger. And I was like, cool, I don't care. And he's like, well, they don't have infantry slots right now, which was a lie. And he's like, so you're going to be an, a cook. And I was like, excuse me? You guys have that in the military? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. I thought everyone would just run and gun, you know? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but you only got to do it for like three months. And then you could, you know, switch over to infantry. And I was like, well, I could do anything for three months. Um, so I ended up going cook. I, I, yeah, I went cook. It was absolutely <laughs> miserable. I knew I was out of my element immediately. Um, I got hurt in ranger selection, like real bad, messed up my ankle. I went to Germany in 173rd, um, scored a spot as a personal security detachment for the Sergeant Major, thank God. So I didn't have to, I could actually go out of the wire and I didn't have to, you know, flip eggs for a deployment. Um, and then he sent me a month home early to go to uh, special forces selection. But the reason I chose special forces was because on the FOB, you know, when, when the helicopters are coming in with injured vets or, you know, injured, um, soldiers, I would go just to see some kind of action. Right. So I was like, I, I need to dip my toes in, in something. Um, and we had a field surgical team on our FOB and these two green berets come off the bird and they're just full of holes. I mean, they just got lit up and I'm watching them, you know, pump their chest and, the blood's just spurting out like six different holes on these dudes. And I was like, damn, these guys are like legit out there getting after it. Like this is intense. And it kind of hit me. And I was like, I was like, all right, I'm going to do that. Yeah, so, that's so that was the one. It wasn't a recruit. It's a weird poster. selling point. Yeah, right. Like, like, man, it takes a lot to convince you. <laughs> yeah. That's a, a pretty dramatic um you know, just envisioning that as, uh, you know, the job that you were doing, stepping into it. Um, it's kind of like Men of Honor a little bit. I don't know if you guys have seen that before, but, you know, for the viewers, obviously you guys have seen it before, but for the viewers, go back and watch that. He starts out as a cook and then he sees a guy jump off, go swimming and dive in after the dude. It's pretty similar. Anyway, That's so um, for you, um, you know, we, we get a lot of guests on here that talk about the same, uh, similar type of thing, you know, where they had that experience of like, man, I saw this guy, like RJ Casey, when we brought him on here, he's like, I saw this one guy and he was getting after and he was doing this and you were already downrange. You were already able to see that and everything like that. Um, you know, I don't know how much you knew about special forces at that point besides that, but was there a specific job you were trying to get into? Because we haven't really covered that whole thing, but there's different teams and regions that they cover based on, you know, what jobs they have and that kind of stuff. So was there anything specifically that you were looking for, or can you cover down a little bit of, uh, of that for the people that are watching out here on how that kind of breaks down? Like what, once I decided to go special operate special forces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you kind of just decide as you go, like some guys have, because you don't know what you're going to get. 
And so you don't want to get attached to anything specific, but you start throughout the Q course, you start learning like there's tricks to kind of like manipulate your environment a little bit, I guess you could say. So like, you know that, well, this language goes to this group and this group goes to Afghanistan or this group goes to Africa. So you could start like trying to work the system a little bit by being like, well, I really want this language because I want to go to this group and I want to get deployed to, you know, a war zone. So a lot of guys will start doing that really early on, you know, and in, in requesting certain groups or studying up on that, you know, language to try and prove that that that's the, the language they should get, you know, things like that. But you really don't learn. You don't really know until you get into the process and then you start to learn from each other and the guys ahead of you and things like that. Um, but for me, like I picked French because I was like, well, I'm really dumb. And like, I don't think I'm going to pass like a hard language, like Russian or, I don't know, uh, Chinese or something crazy that some of these like really smart kids were doing. So I was like, what's the easiest one? They're like French and Spanish. And I was like, well, Spanish would be dope because my wife is Peruvian and she speaks Spanish. So that'd be cool. But Spanish goes to seventh group. And my wife was like, I don't want to live in Florida. <laughs> so I was like, well, then the other easy one is French. So we'll, we'll do that and then hopefully get a uh, 10th group. Um, unfortunately, 10th group at that time was going to Africa, which wasn't seeing a lot of combat. But then I got lucky because as soon as I got there, my team was in Africa. Um, and then they came back. And the minute they came back, they're like, hey, we need to give third group a break. Like third group has been smashed in Afghanistan and Iraq for years. Like, like third group was, there's so many combat vets like that have just seen so many deployment after deployment after deployment. Like my buddy Jerry's, I think he's on like his eighth combat deployment. Like he's got, he spent years already over in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's ridiculous. So like, it's crazy, right? Like years of yeah. your life in a war zone. That's nuts. Yeah, so, absolutely. So they're like, hey, we got to give third group a break. So we're going to send start send 10th group to Afghanistan. And I was like, oh, sweet. So the timing just worked out for me. And it all came from that language selection way back in the yeah. pipeline for you. That was it. It was like, you were like, listen, I'm not smart enough for, you know, Pashtun, so I'm going to go to this. So yeah. take yourself back to that that pipeline. So, you know, walk us through for for people that might not know. So you're you're a cross trainee or, you know, you kind of were already in a little bit, but just walk us through the the SF pipeline, right? So we, it starts with SFAS, right? So what was yeah. your what was your training like before you showed up to SFAS? And that's the Special Forces Assessment and Selection, correct? Yeah. So okay. yeah. So SFAS, Special Forces Assessment and Selection. So you do it's gonna you know it's gonna break you off, but you obviously have no idea like how much. And you just see guys from your unit like going and then they come back and excuse me. Almost all of them are like, Yeah, I failed this or I failed that. And so it's just like it starts to crush your soul a little bit before you even get there. Cause it's just like, it's like, it seems like everyone that goes like comes back and is just having these like negative experiences and like they didn't pass. And, you know, and it's like, it starts to get a little daunting. Cause you're like, man, like some of these guys are in better shape than me. And they're, you know, I think they're better dudes than I am. Um, so that mental aspect, I think is hard for a lot of guys and, they really struggle with that, right? It's like, like you have to at some point just step up to the plate and realize that you may not be good enough, but you're going to have to find out. Yeah. Well, so, in, in football, that's why they say, that's why you got to play the game, right? Like it doesn't matter what the odds are before the game. That's why you got to go, you know, put it on the table and see what happens. Right. And that's a great point. And it, it, like a lot of, I mean, everyone on this podcast, right? Everyone talking right now has stepped up to that plate, but man, like we all felt it, you know, we all felt that like, we're not good enough. Like there's no way. And, but we still had to show up and find out. And I think that was, that mental aspect is, is really tough. Yeah, absolutely. So did, did you feel like you were prepared? Like when that, when you started, I mean, when it started to get real at SFAS, were you like, oh no, <laughs> oh no, this is way worse than <laughs> I thought. Or, or did you feel okay? Did you feel like your preparation was good for it? Or what, what did you even do to get ready to go? I felt okay. I felt I did a lot of rucking and running. And that's why I tell guys like, like you get used to that ruck on your back. Like I got to the point where I rucked blisters into my feet and before I even went. So I, I knew that in order, like the minute I was going to get blisters, I knew the spots that they were going to show up on my feet 
And I knew that if I put moleskin on those spots beforehand, they wouldn't show up. So I was like, sweet. That's a huge, you know, part of a way that I don't have to worry about. Cause you, you watch guys and they'll be crushing it. And then they get that fat blister and it's just like every step you could see their morale just dropping a little bit and like that pain shooting up and it just, it tanks them. And you're just like, man, you are sinking quick, dude. And you were a hero like yesterday, but that blister, it just got in your head, man. Oh, so, man. yeah. So that's one thing I did was like, r- like heavily focus on blisters and prevention for blisters and things like that. But mainly my, my workouts up leading up to SFAS was, um, two CrossFit workouts a day and then, um, rucking up to 10 miles, like three times a week and running, uh, almost every day. So it wasn't an astronomical amount of working out, but you have to, for me anyway, and this is just like a knuckle dragger way to think about it. I wanted my body to, to know, to feel like something was coming every day that it had to be prepared for. And it didn't know what it was going to be. And that's why, whether you're a fan of CrossFit or not, it's so beneficial for these kind of events because it's like that constantly varying movements. And that's what selections are. Like, you're not going to do the same workout every day. Yeah. You know, CrossFit for what it is, a general physical preparedness system that is constantly varied and always varying. I, I mean, I do think that there's benefit, you know, I don't think it's the end all be all, but you know, just no. like you said, it's, it's different stuff every day. I was a, I was a CrossFit guy way back when you'd go on the main site. Like I was a main site wad guy, <laughs> you know, growing, like when mm-hmm. I was getting ready to cross train and it was like, you just logged in, you didn't know what you were going to do. And there was the workout and I, I totally agree. So what was the, uh, what was the hardest part for you? SFAS, what, what part did you struggle with? Oof. Um, honestly, the, the weight in team week was astronomical. Like that was something that I did not expect. Like down pilot, that apparatus, when they put it on my back is like every step I took, I felt like my hips were like pushing out of the socket. And I was like, I can't sustain this. Like legitimately my hips are, are going to pop out, but then you have to keep taking a step. And then but what makes team week so valuable and what I didn't understand at the moment was they always built in a chance for you to be a shit bag. So it's like, so in that, in that moment, like you have the apparatus on your back, you feel like your hips are going to pop out and then it's your turn for a break. Well, are you the guy that's like taking a couple extra steps to prolong that break? Or are you the guy that's like, get me back in there. It's my turn my time is up, get me back in there. And it's like, that was something I didn't realize until way after selection, looking back on it and being like, man, they set that up perfectly. Yeah. It's like, they get, yeah, <laughs> they gave you just enough opportunity to scurve yep. out and to screw the team. Diabolical, exactly. diabolical. Exactly. And that one of the things was, um, the, they, ha- they always had a map reading guy and it's like, listen, you, you're going, <laughs> you're, yeah. The, the map reader. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, come on, dude. And so one of the guys, he read the map like the whole time he, and the map reader doesn't carry the apparatus. He's looking at the map and he's making sure you don't get lost. So this one guy, and it's his third time to selection and that's, that's it. You get three times and then you're NTR never to return. Um, and he's taking this map position and dude, he's on the map for like the entire apparatus. I'm like, dude, are you ever going to help us like push this thing? Or are you just going to stare at the damn map? Like we know that we have to make a right. It's not that hard. No, you know? his answer is I'm going to stare at this map the entire time. <laughs> that looks hard <laughs> yeah. over there. I'm reading. Yeah. It's way easier. Right. And so he took the easy way out and he just read the map and he didn't get selected. Well, when I picked up on the, I picked up on the fact that he was making me mad. I didn't like game the system in the moment, but I was like, I'm not going to do that to my guys because when it was being done to me, it was taking me off. So at one point they called my roster number and they're like, Hey man, take the map. You're the map guy. And I was like, okay. So the cadres tell me I have to do it. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So I look at the map and I'm like, okay, so I have a half a mile and then we make a right and then we're done. Like we're, we're not going to miss this road, you know, a half a mile up make a right. It's the first road, make a right. Right. Like, I don't yeah. need a map for that. You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. If it looks like a road, make a right. Right. 
so I put the, I fold the map up and I put it in my pocket and I was like, okay, cool. So I start pushing the apparatus again and he calls me, he screams my roster number. I was like, ah, oh, crap. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, candidate, do you need that map? And I was like, negative. I was like, well, make it right. First road I'm tracking. And he was like, all right, give me the map and get back to pushing. And I knew in that moment, like instantly I knew that was his way of telling me like, finally, dude, you like finally someone... somebody figured it out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And as an instructor that I, I love that I, when, the, when the students crack the code on it, when they figure out how to beat the instructor, how to beat the game, man, Brian, I don't know how you feel about that, but that was one of my favorite things of all time. Yeah, hundred percent. That's what you're there for at Indoc or selection. When I was going through Indoc, you know, it's like, is this person going to think for themselves and think like, what is the objective to do? Like, what are we giving these people the objective to do? And are you going to actually, you know, find the best way to do it? Like if, if they figure it out and like they find a shortcut, I didn't brief them not to do that. Like, dang. All right. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, hydrate while I think of something else and then we're going to crush you again, figure something else out. (laughs) Right. Well, and that's, that's why I think a lot of candidates don't understand, right? And I didn't get to do like a lot of time in guard as a selection cadre because I was going through the police academy and I was like, I was stressed. And so, and Cody, the guy that runs 19th group uh, down there, he's a great dude. So he's like, dude, if you're stressed, man, don't even bother. Don't even worry about it. So I was like, I took him up on that, but I wish I would have done more because it's like candidates need to understand that when you're a cadre, like you want them to succeed, like you, you are, you are there to, to see the future, you know, step up to the plate and to fill your shoes. Like you're not there to, to weed everyone out. So you could, and that's what they think, right? It's like, I'm here to prove how tough it is to make sure all you guys fail. It's like, no, man, I'm here to, to hope that there's a gleaming, you know, like inspiration in, in some of you that I could latch onto and be proud of. So I go home and sleep better at night, knowing that you're taking our spot yeah. and, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, we all we all feel the same way. Trent and I did a little uh, uh, little YouTube you know video between the two of us, and we hit that pretty extensively. It was always my goal as an instructor. Like, I want a hundred percent to graduate. That was always my goal was a hundred percent graduation. I all we always went in that you know as an instructor staff. One of the uh, one of the things that we've moved to, we've gone uh, much more to an attributes based selection. So we're looking for that right person. And you mentioned it earlier. Is Army Special Forces moving towards that attribute based selection, or have you guys always done that? I think that that's honestly because a lot of guys have been hit me up about that lately. They're like, oh, how, I heard it's getting weaker, dude. And like, and and women are allowed, and that, and all this stuff. Yeah, and we're like, getting we get the same thing. Yeah, and first of all, I would say to them one of my partners in the police account or in the police department on a special team was a woman. And she was one of the most gangster hard people I've ever had the pleasure to work with. So if you think that having women on board is going to dilute the standard, well, then you're just an ignorant human being because they're it, like good, solid teammates does not matter what gender you are. Like it doesn't, no one cares what gender you are. If you have the heart to have my back and to pull me out of the gunfire and to support me no matter what, then you're the kind of person that I want behind me. So that all that excuses stuff like, oh, it's getting so easy. It's like, that's trash, dude. First of all, no, it's not. It's, it's always going to be difficult. But the guys that are in selection or, you know, as cadre, we just want to see that same kind of mentality replace us because we've been on the teams and we've been to war and you know we just want to be replaced with the same kind of mindset so regardless of what some like higher up officer who's running sfas you know and he's trying to appease some general and get x amount of people passing and x amount of attrition rate and all this garbage like whatever that's his job right but the boots on the ground are always going to look for what they had and what they want to see. And that's always that heart in that, you know, that person that's going to really, you know, have your back and that's not going to change. Yeah. I think that's huge. It's, it's the standard and then it's, you got to be the right person for the team. Right. And mm-hmm. I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think anything else matters. So, um, let's go through, you, you got through SFAS. Let's walk through this, um, in order. Uh, first off, when you got selected, you know, when they call your name, 
what was that like? Was that just like over the moon? I made it or like surprise? That was, that was the, that was one of the best feelings of my life. So he, we're waiting. And I, I talked about this in the book. Cause it's like, and in the book, I don't, I don't, I don't talk about like, look at me, look what I've done. Like people that read that are going to be like, wow, this dude is, this dude should be dead. It's all, it's just a lot about mistakes, you know, and, and stupid things that I did. And, and they're going to be like, well, it's, you know, Buck's an idiot, man. Um, but, one of the things I talk about is like that day, cause at the end, right. You like, you finally finish. So you have a, like the last ruck March and it's like 55 pounds ruck. And they don't tell you how far it is, but we calculated it. And it was, I think it was around 24 miles. Um, and it was brutal, but at the end of it, you're like, you feel so good to be done, but you're like, was this all for nothing? You know? And that could, it just would ruin it. So you sit around waiting for like two hours for them to call your name. And then the idea is that you get called, your name gets called, you go in with a cadre and then they, they sit down with you and they tell you all the things you did good, all the things you did bad. And it's like, and then at the end of that, they're like, you're a select or non-select. And I'm sitting here just like, like all of us are just pacing back and forth. Right. Cause it's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can handle like this dude telling me all the things that I did bad. Like, <laughs> well, and it's, it's like, are you starting off with the good things or, or is this like, like if they sandwich off, it? Yeah, exactly. Was, are you starting off with yeah. a good, if they start off with a good thing, are you, are you doing it so that you've let me down soft? If you start off with a bad thing, does it mean it's just all bad things? <laughs> like, right, exactly. And that's like, I just didn't, I just didn't want to hear it, dude. Like, like I was already like such a broken person, like from my childhood and, and, and the reason I'm going through special operations is trying to prove something to myself and to see if I have what it takes. I never, you know, had a father figure. I never had like an adult role model to tell me I was good enough. So I, I honestly didn't know I'm like taking a huge shot in the dark. And so like this guy doesn't know that him, like having someone I look up to, tell me negative things about myself could absolutely crush me. Like I'm a, I'm, I'm a sensitive human being, you know, and I'm there to kind of like gain some of their, um, you know, respect. And so it was really a scary thing for me. Like I was really, really scared. And then he calls my roster number and I was like, Oh God, <laughs> here we go. And he calls me up and he looks at me. He's like, you want the, the long version or a short version? And I was like, short version, please. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted. Like I didn't want the long version. And he was like, you got selected. Now get the fuck away from me. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah. And I started screaming. And I, I go up and I get in line. And every person that's ever been to selection is going to know Chahavin lady. She's the meanest human being. And she just looks at me and she goes, Chahavin. And if you don't say what you're having fast enough, she what? skips you. And it's like, dude, I am starving to death. And you're going to have it. And then she skips me. And I'm like, no, I, I don't care what I'm having. Just give me anything. So I get to the, the line with the Chahavin lady and she's like, lines closed to, to candidates. And I was like, no, are you serious? And she's like, she's like, Q course only. And I was like, you, I'm going to own you one day, lady. Like you and me are going to be cool. But she ruined, she ruined my high is basically what I'm getting at. I was on right a high back down then, to earth. Yeah. yeah. Chahavin lady just sent me right back. Those defect ladies are brutal, man. Like <laughs> you, you made it through the whole selection and she yeah. just crushed it. She just crushed yeah, me, she man. She does like, not care. She's like, I've seen so many of you before. Chahavin, yeah. too late. Get out of here. Yep. Oh, <laughs> uh -huh. she, she hates Canada. And so for all you guys going to selection, I hope she's still there because at this point she's a staple. She's like, she's like as important as like any other <laughs> Part as like the apparatus itself is Chahavin lady, and Dude. she hates you. And you're gonna feel that like hate. generation to generation. I'm pretty sure it's been <laughs> in her family for like 50 years. When I was when I was at Indoc, when I was at Indoc, we had a bus driver, and it was like hell night, and it was like this impossible timeline of like get the entire team plus a log plus all your team gear onto the bus, and we start trying to do this impossible timeline. And this this lady bus driver looks at us as we're trying to do this, and she goes. You're not gonna make it. <laughs> like, we were all like, "For real, lady? Like, you, wow." She was like, "Oh yeah, you're not gonna make it." We were just like, "Whatever." So we, of course, in true team fashion, we turned her into like the the 
like demotivational parrot. Ah, you're not going to make it. Yeah, so yeah. That's it took on a life of its own. But yeah, I've also been uh, I've also been bullied by support staff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They've seen more Hell Knights than any of the instructors there, except for Kilbride. You know, if he's, yeah, exactly. he's still around there. Yeah, still nobody's there. nobody's seen more than Kilbride. Uh, Ross is never leaving. Anyway, uh, so the rest of the uh, the pipeline though after selection. What does that look like? I'm I'm fairly ignorant to it. You know, I've heard of the Q course and all that, but how does the rest of it break down? And yes. uh, how do you get your um your assignment? So you'll go to you'll you'll go back to your unit, and then you'll PCS. So your whole family is going to move with you uh, to Bragg. And then once you get to Bragg, you'll in process and you'll have like an in doc phase. I forget what they call it, but it's like, it's basically gates. We call it gates and you have to pass like your runs, your rucks. It's just a, your PT tests, all that stuff. So your, your, your swim tests, you're basically just going through all the gates again to make sure you, you didn't like get out of shape in the time that you went back and then came back. Um, so then, and then part of that though is land nav and land nav is the crusher. Like land nav in, in Bragg at that spot is just insane like i call we call them draw monsters and those draw monsters just eat you alive like i've never been like hung up in the air just by like a plant in my life and it's just like <laughs> north carolina sucks to land now because it's just, it's all pine trees and it's like you can't really see anything you like unless you're really you're essentially land naving with a blanket on your head and then every once yep. in a while it's a 15 foot drop yep I felt at one point I fell in like a five foot deep hole. I was just walking and I couldn't see anything because the light from. So at first I thought it was a blessing, right? Because I was like, there's a light at the cadre hut that's shining my way. So I was like, I can't get lost. Well, the, it ended up being no illume. So the light is completely blinding me. And I'm like, I, I was cussing that light, like out loud, screaming at that light for miles just because I'm tripping. I'm landing on my face like every I can't see anything. And then all of a sudden I'm walking. And one time I tripped and I, my face like takes a dive into the dirt. My ruck slams my face into the ground. <laughs> and then I look to my right and there's a tree like, or a, a branch that's coming out like that. And I was like, I just laying in the dirt, just being like, that would have impaled my face. And like, it would be, I'd be dead. So that's cool. So land nav could be very cool. And then I'm walking and then I just fall in a hole and I'm like, what? Who like who allowed this five foot deep <laughs> this human sized hole? Yeah. This is really dangerous, guys. <laughs> been I'm like, you're not looking out for, for my best ever. interest at all. Yeah. It's like so, Bragg and Campbell. It's all the same thing. And all those ranges just have like old DFPs dug all over the place. And yeah. you're on nods. You can't, you can never see it. Everybody just disappears in one. It's it's like a rite of passage. Yeah, it's trash. It's trash. It's like, come on, dude. Like, I need to survive this to become special for you. Like, you're just trying to murder me. This is like some kind of weird obstacle course and is so what are we talking about uh the rest of the pipeline we're not getting very far but you know oh, after sfas you come back uh, q course how you get your assignment to uh what you're going to do on the team oh yeah sorry this happens all the time like i've had i've had a few tbis so i'm just kind of mm -hmm. i just kind of rant that's, that's why good. editing is like super important for everything that i do on the interwebs um so yeah, so you'll go you go through that phase, and then once you pass land nav and all that stuff, you go through small unit tactics. Um, I've heard small unit tactics got shortened, shortened, but small unit tactics is an absolute nightmare. That's for me, it was like freezing cold and like miserable, like hundred pound rucks, and you just over and over and over and over small like basic um, small unit infantry tactics. So you know linear ambushes and things like that. Um, you do that for like two months. That's, that's another one that gets a lot of guys. Um, first of all, it's just the weight gets to them. They quit a lot. Um, they get dropped a lot for not, you know, meeting the standards and things like that, or, uh, safety violations, you name it. Small unit tactics is kind of like one of the, at least when I went was one of the big, uh, choppers, um, small unit tactics, you get through that and then you go to sear, uh, sear, get done. You go to MOS phase. So that's when we all split up as a class and then whatever your MOS is, you'll go to that um, MOS, you know, 18 Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, comms, uh, medic, um, weapons sergeant, what else? Uh, and then demolitions is the Charlies. Yeah, demo engineer, right? And then you were, you were a Bravo, right? Were you a weapons sergeant? 
Yeah. Yeah. So okay. I went weapon sergeant again. It was, I just based everything off the fact that I felt like I was a complete income poop. So I was like, what's the easiest MOS? And they're like, probably Bravo. I was like, I'll take All right, it. I'm going to, I'm going to speak French. I'm going to be a Bravo. Yeah. And I'm going to be the map guy. And that's how you're going to get through your entire pipeline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just do that. Dude. You guys would be good. Your attrition rate would be like, attrition rate would be like 0%. Just follow Buck. Be Bravo, <laughs> French, like all the, all the easy stuff. This is awesome. And then from MOS, you go, what is after MOS? Is it Robin Sage? I think you go Robin Sage. And then Robin Sage is that like culminating exercise where, and like, dude, those cadre, they have that, they have Robin Sage down. So it's like, there's almost like, like 10 layers of, um, you know, events that could happen depending on the decisions that you make. So, you know, that's where they really teach you to think like a green beret, right? Cause it's like, well, Hey, the enemy could use this access point to attack our position. So you think, well, well, we could just blow up that access point. And that's where they start to teach you is like, now nah, there's second and third order effects. And if you blow up that access point, now you just cut off the village that requires that access point for food. And that village is the one that's supporting you. And now you can't grow a gorilla force um, to fight on your behalf. So it really, that's where it starts to get in depth and the, like all the courses start clicking and you start realize like, okay, this is why we do this. So I, I thought of Robin Sage is like the why, um, and it kind of teaches you basic what Green Berets actually do. Um, and then once you get done with Robin Sage, then you got six months of language, which is just for guys that are like not good in school, it's the worst. It's the worst. Like every day for eight hours a day, like I'd rather peel my fingernails off than study French for eight hours a day, five days a week. And then like my French teacher, teacher, like hated us. She's like, you guys are the worst class ever. One of my buddies, a captain, he farted in the class and it stunk so bad. <laughs> it stunk so bad. And like, and where she's from in Africa that like, it's so disrespectful for like a man to fart in front of a woman that she was so humiliated. Like she went to the bathroom first and vomited. And then finally, when she got, got done throwing up, she came back and just started cursing us all out about how gross, disgusting, <laughs> and like and like how people in, in her society would never act with such disdain and disgust. So that, <laughs> that was like the best moment of that so six months. all in all, how long is the pipeline for you guys? Uh, I think it's about... Like if you pass everything the first time, you're looking at just under two years. Okay. And that's once you graduate your language and then after you're done with your language, then you go to, you know, whatever unit you're going to get to PCS to that kind of thing. What yep. point do you get your beret? Uh, so before when I went, you had to wait till you're done with language and then you're officially graduated and then you got your beret. Um, I think right now they get their beret before language. So they have their berets throughout language, which, I don't agree with that. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you don't want to like give, you don't want to give them the carrot and then be like, now finish. You know, it's like, yeah. you really should dangle that thing all the way to the end. <laughs> but again, yeah. that's just whoever's, whatever officer's leading it and whatever he feels is important at that time, they'll switch out and it'll probably go back to what it was. But so right now I think you get your green beret before language. And so once you get your, your beret, I can remember the feeling that I had when I got my beret is like, man, this is so awesome. I finally have this beret and I'm actually going to a PJ, you know, I have my boots, blouse and all that kind of stuff. I took all these pictures, got a tattoo, all that, that goes with becoming a PJ or whatever. And what did it feel like when you showed up to you, the unit, the first day, did you still have that same, like, Oh, I made it. I'm a green beret now. Or was it like the, what you have in lady all again? All over oh yeah. Again? Yeah. You get, you get sent. Well, and that's what I tell guys, like, listen, when you earn your green beret, you're at the top of the totem pole, right? Because you're in your totem pole is training. So being at the top of that totem pole is earning and finishing that training. And it's like you need to remember before you go back to before you get assigned to group and show up to group, that's a different totem pole. This isn't training anymore. And you are at the bottom of the bottom. So you get to your team and it's like, like I walked into my team room and I was like, I'm here. Yeah, I'm your new Bravo. <laughs> And they were, no one even looked at me. They were just like, I'm like, shut That's the up. word. They just completely ignored you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're just, you're like, hey, everybody, what's up? And then you're wondering if you said that out loud. 
That's and that's what happened. They just looked at. They didn't even look at me. They were just kept like doing whatever they're doing. And so I just stared at them and I'm like, what do I do now? Like I don't know what the, besides the intro. That's what I had and that's what I worked out in my head for the last couple of weeks. And then finally, um, one of the the Delta, um, the medic, yeah, he's in CAG now, but he was like, he finally looks up at me and he's like, Team Sergeant's over there, dude. Go talk to him. And I was like, okay. So I went over to the team sergeant. And I was like, I sit at Prairie Rest. And I was like, I was like, hey, he's, uh, you know, Mass Sergeant. I was like, my my name's Sean. And all that. and he's like, he's like, I was like, my name's Sean Rogers. And he's like, yeah, Rogers, like Buck Rogers. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, like Buck Rogers. And he's like, cool story, Buck. Get away from me and don't stand at parade rest when you talk to me. It's and weird. that's it. And that's how it happened. And for the rest of your life, you've <laughs> yeah. never lived it down. <laughs> yeah. That was it, dude. Buck stuck and it sucked. So for those dudes that are, you know, because we have a lot of guys that are actually going through the pipeline, they're listening or they're showing up at the first unit. And I think a lot of the rules kind of apply to anybody that's in the military. What would you say is the best attribute of like a young guy that you would want to see, you know, if you were mentoring them or, you know, if you were the team sergeant showed up, there's a young guy in front of you. What would you say is the best practices for one of those guys for FNG, so to speak? Yeah. So for all the FNG showing up, there's, there's one of two things going to happen to you. You're walking into a lion's den, right? And these these people want to do one of two things. Every one of them. There's not there's not one that wants to do anything different. He wants to build you up or he wants to shove you down into the ground and destroy you. And your actions are going to dictate which one of those he's going to take. If you're humble and you know your place and you want to learn and you're hungry and you understand your role, he's going to want to build you up. If you come in arrogant, and overconfident and thinking that because you were handed a green beret that you earned your spot, he's going to want to tear you down to the ground to, uh, to get you to understand just how low you really are. So what he does is just really up to you. You need to understand that, you know, he's got, he wants to, he's going to do one of two things. He's in, you know, your actions are going to dictate which one of those he does. Yeah. And I think that humility and just being humble and realizing like you haven't made anything, you haven't done anything. You just showed up to the unit and you literally just trained. You just finished kinder kindergarten and all these other people, you know, have been through college. They've been on so mm -hmm. many deployments and they've seen so many things and the practices that you kind of looked at through training. Yeah. A lot of them apply and all that kind of things as, as far as the techniques and that kind of stuff to employ that. But you don't know about, you know, preparing, even setting up your kid or any of that kind of stuff because you've never been down range and you don't know what the best practices are. So they're keeping that sense of humbleness and being really, I always, you know, tell younger guys, like your job is literally to take out the trash every day, vacuum, do all the little things that make, because really it's training and doing all the little things like that mm -hmm. and keeping yourself humble because you're there to learn from all these guys that have so much experience and so much time down range, because that is what's going to save your butt one day when you actually end up going down range, they have to see that you're competent, you're capable to do the little things that will take care of the team in order for you to, you know, progress and continue to do the mission. And I think that shows uh, a huge value for a character and the person that you're going to become as they want to mentor you. Like you were talking about, like, am I, is this guy worth spending the time on to mentor or is it the guy that's just going to think he already knows everything and then you're going to just watch him fail. And once he fails, because he is so cocky about it, obviously you have to completely shut it down. So he doesn't, you know, he knows that, all right, it's time to learn now. Are you ready to learn? Are you ready to like actually be humble and listen or are you just going to keep on doing the same dumb thing and not actually listening? So I think that's a, a huge um, thing to go about and make sure new guys know whenever they show up to the team, because we we've we all been there and we know what the best practices are and what we want to see for team sergeant. Right. Um, so I think, you know, from there, the normal question we ask everybody you know, from any branch or any kind of job like this, what is the typical day like for you guys? Um, when you're not deployed, just home station in garrison type of thing. How do you guys go about your day? Uh, so the, a team is going to, it's, it's heavily competitive, right? And that's probably something a lot of people don't realize that within a company, you have six teams and each team is fighting. All their garrison time is spent fighting for the best mission on the next deployment. 
And that is huge, right? So you think that like, that's something that we don't talk about. That's really something that we kind of just, it just is what it is, right? So when we come back and it's garrison time, you're setting up your whole training calendar for the time that you got back to the time that you leave again to prove to command and to show to command and to, first of all, to get each other trained up to where um, you're the best team in the company and to show command that you're training harder than everybody else and that you're putting in more work than everybody else. So that way, when command gets those missions, you're the one that's getting the one where you're going after ISIS and, and knocking them down instead of being like, hey, someone's got to hold down this spot, you know, this outpost that's not, that's obviously not going to get any action. And you don't want to be that team, right? So you spend all your time train, like pl planning that calendar and getting everything set up and training and busting your butt and, you know, humping to prove that, that you guys are, are better. And I think that's what really probably what, you know, iron sharpens iron, you know? And so we're not comparing ourselves to, can we accomplish the mission? Like, right. Cause then it's like, well, an infantry guy could accomplish the every, mission. The mi Yeah. Every team in the battalion can accomplish a mission. You want to be the number one team. You want to beat those other teams. Exactly. So they spend their time just grinding to be the best team. And that has that residual effect where everyone uplifted each other to where even your worst team is a great team. And unfortunately, yeah. they just weren't good enough to get the best mission. Yeah, absolutely. When you're talking about making that training plan, people always focus in on the cool schools, you know, long distance shooting or, or free fall events. What kind of, what kind of training were you doing leading up to that first deployment to really set yourself apart as that premier team? That's a, that's a great question, right? Cause it, like exactly what you said, people want to, well, I went to sniper school. I went to this school. It's like, well, did you go to that school or did the team go to that school? Because if you went to that school, that doesn't do us any good. Because you're a great sniper, that doesn't do us any good. Is the team capable of operating together as a, a unit? That's what's going to make us a good team. Because you could send your guy, you know, you could, you could, as a team, you could look like studs, right? You send three guys to Ranger School, two guys to Sniper School, a guy to Halo School. You come back and your team's, you're briefing the Sergeant Major, and you're like, look at all these schools we knocked out. Like, I, I got a team of studs. And he's going to be like, all right, cool. Come PMT, you know, your pre-mission training out in Texas. I'm going to see what kind of studs you got because I'm going to run you through some crazy stuff. You're going to have real like world training operations um, that mimic the real world. And whether you guys are able to operate as a team is going to decide whether or not you're a good team. So that team that spent one guy spent, you know, two months in ranger school and recycle spent four months in ranger school. And then this guy was gone on this school and this guy was gone on that school. You spent less time working together as, as a team. So yeah, maybe this other team didn't like, can't brief as, as beautifully and doesn't look great on paper, but they were hitting the range doing CQB as a team consistently all the time. And now when they kick in a door, it's fluid. They're not dropping dead space. Yep. It's They're, just violence. Yeah. And you can yes. always tell, you can always tell, especially the first couple runs at a house. When you watch a team go through, you know, immediately you can pick out the guys that have been working with each other for a long period of time. And sometimes you can't describe it, but you know it when you see it. Absolutely. And that to me is what makes a good team. And that, so that unity is, and, uh, it's kind of unfortunate, right? Because a, a big part of that is not really in your control too, because you sometimes it's like a living organism. Like sometimes you get the right people that vibe with each other and they respect each other and they just flow well together. So sometimes you just get the right people on a team and all of a sudden it's like the best team in the company just because everyone likes each other and everyone's having fun and everyone's crushing life. So they go out and train and it's like, Everyone is working so much harder just to support the dude next to him because they genuinely like that guy. And all of a sudden, that team, regardless of what they do, they're going to win the top spot because they're just the best. All I got to say is five flight, best flight in the squadron. I feel that way on my team right now. I feel like I'm on I'm on one of those teams that you, like, you just catch lightning in a bottle. Mm. Um, you know, we're in our pre-deployment as well, and, and we're getting ready to go downrange and, and do some good things too. But man, I'm I'm totally bought in to exactly what you're saying, man. Cause I, yeah. I feel that and I lived it. So when you went down range for, you know, that first time, 
what was that like? Cause I mean, that's, that's really, people think that, you know, putting the beret on or, or walking around post and everybody goes, Oh, there's a special operator. They think you've made it then. I know for me, the very first time that I was like, Holy crap, I, this is, this is real was when I was on my first deployment in Iraq. So how was it for you on that first deployment? Yeah. And I would agree with that hundred percent. Like once you've, once you've got your whistle wet with some on two way range, that's when things start to change for you. And to me, it was like, it was a lot of really good and a lot of really bad. Like I did some really stupid, stupid things that almost got me killed and almost got other people killed. And then I watched, I, you know, I watched teammates, like one of them who's in um, CAG now and dude, he threw a grenade. He went to throw a grenade at this dude over a wall and it hit the tree and came back on our side and blew up. And then one of my teammates is taking shrapnel to the leg from his grenade. And it's like, we we're all just, and I had this uh, CIA dude tell me, because he was pulling me up a wall at one point, and um, I had a 320 attached to my side, and I wasn't supposed to load it, like because I had it, I had the the attachment was a cord that went through the trigger well, and which is obviously stupid, right? But I was like, yeah. So I was like, well, I'm not going to load it. It's just gonna. I don't have an attachment for this thing, but this is where I want it. And then I carried a bandolier of HEDP rounds, HE rounds, um, uh, gas around my waist for, you know, wherever I needed it. And that thing ended up saving our lives because I used it to blow up V-bids and stuff and in clear um, open spaces with gas. And um, so it came in instrumentally, but this one instance, I was like, I went to load it and shoot it because we're taking contact. And then the CIA guy was like, hey, dude, come up here. I got a better spot. So instead of dumping that round like I planned to, I reattached it. And he went to pull me up the wall and he grabbed my hand and he's pulling me up the wall and it, it pulls and it pulls the cord and shoots. And so I got 320 dunk, right down the side. <laughs> What's up? No, oh, I'm just, wow. Oh, he's out. Adder, no, I'm, out. I'm sorry. Did oh, it actually go. fire? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It, it <laughs> Sorry, went. I was muted. I was, I was like, holy crap. So you, you, you ND a 320 on your hip? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was pulling me up and he had my arm like this and he's pulling me up the wall because there's no ladder. So I'm like crawling up the wall and I had an AT4 around my uh, neck. Like I was just overwhelmed with like too much shit. And he's pulling me up the wall and it's like scraping my side and, it, and he goes, dunk. And I was like, oh my God. And I get up to the top and I could see smoke coming out of the 320. And I was, I looked at him and he's obviously, cause he was a Sergeant Major, Green Beret Sergeant Major. And then he's now he's a, a CIA ground branch um, guy. And he looks at me and he's like, oh, your gun went off. And then he just went and I was like, and he, it was like, it was nothing. He like, he didn't even just, care. Just, sorry. You kicked yeah. a 40 my ground out. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. He, he was like, he didn't even care. I ended up finding him after and was like, dude, I can't believe that happened. Like, I, I'm so sorry. Like, I don't, I just made a huge mistake. And he goes, dude, he goes, don't even worry about it. He's like, you're going to play war. He's like, stupid stuff's going to happen, man. He's like, this is, this is the game. And from that point, because that was like my initial point, I watched so many dumb things happen in combat it's like grenades that my teammates are throwing are coming back at me and um i watched my one of my teammates decide he was gonna like alley-oop a grenade over the wall but first like why he's standing over me because i'm hiding in like a little um hole in the ground trying not to get shot and he, he's standing over me and he pulls the pin and cooks it and so i'm looking up at him cooking a grenade over my face and i'm like are you gonna throw that thing like please anytime now and then he just like he like LeBron James, he just jumps and he like does this little move over the top of the wall. He hit him with a slick finger roll. Dude, he Ice did cold, it. cold, baby. It was like that, man. I mean, he he, <laughs> he rolled that thing. And I'm just watching it like crest the wall. And I'm like, if that bounces back, he cooked it. We're done. It's over. And luckily, it, the, like the wall's right here. And it just was like whoop, right over top. And I was like, oh, my God. Okay. And then I had a team sergeant. He like he was getting mad at the commandos because they were just open firing in the rooms. Like, like that was a thing, right? They would go in a room and they would clear by fire, just dump a whole mag in the room. So he was trying to prove how dumb that was. So he's like, he just lost his mind. And he's like, you want to, you want to open fire in the room? He's like, fine. And he takes grenades and he's like throwing them in the room. And then he's just dumping mags. And he's like, you see how stupid you are. This is what you're doing. And then some of the, one of the grenades, he didn't pull the pin. 
And so it's, or it, it, he did pull the pin. It didn't go off. So now my EOD tech is looking at us like, nah, great, dude. He's like, we're going to have to back clear this. And you have unexploded ordinance in that room. And he's like, and I don't want to go back in there to clear it because it can go off at any time. Because terrifying. Because right. absolutely terrifying. Right. So, and that's my team sergeant. <laughs> it's like, I mean, that's, that's the guy that's supposed to be in charge. So it's like, well, what do we do now? And he was like, well, I'm just going to leave it. Cause what do I do is I go in there and try to disarm it. I get blown up. And so we just got to hope that we remember which room this is and not back clear this room. So point being was like, just dumb stuff just kept happening. And it's like, we were going ham and, you know, and war was nuts, man. So <laughs> I guess that's yeah. the point of the story is like everything changed in war. Cause all that stuff you trained for it, it's so, it's so in this like little perfect little pretty package right with a bow on it and you're like you know how to do cqb you know how to do this because you've been to the range and you've done that and it's like once the bullets start coming back it's like everything changes uh, and i'm sure brian has like the same thing but it's, it's the same thing that we tell the you know the students it's the same thing that we've done is you know the first time you get that nine line and you're like oh yeah it just says it's it's just two patients and they they seem to be fine i got a good report from the ground and you get on the ground and it's eight patients and no one's fine and you're like oh god what is happening you're just like holy holy crap man what is going on yeah yeah and like, I, I think it's important to i'm sorry no go ahead to, to put out there like the some of the mistakes that are made and, and how war is is kinetic and it's not perfect and the training environment is the easiest it's ever going to be and i but i know as an instructor there's always that like that fear like how much do I tell them that we jacked up over there mm -hmm. versus like maintaining your credibility as an instructor? You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm more than happy to tell them about my mistakes, but then like you start to see that, that look in the student's mm -hmm. eyes. Like, so did all you do was jack up over there? You're like, no, no, no. Okay. But like, then you don't want to like, you don't want to be talking about like, it makes yourself like you're working all the time nerds. either. Yeah. Right. It's just, well, and, and you guys, and things. that's, that's why I think the, the FNG Academy and like the channel is like, people kind of resonate with it. Right. Because it's like, I'm not in a position anymore where I have to protect my credibility. And I went, I, I am doing something opposite of all the rest of the green berets on there. And I'm not saying it's special. It's the opposite. It's the exact opposite. It's garbage. Like I'm going on and I'm saying like, these are my mistakes. These are all the things that I've annihilated. I am human. You know, I'm, I've, I've messed up more than you could possibly imagine. And unfortunately, a lot of guys get on social media and it's like, for you guys, it's different, right? For you guys, it's insane because you have to, you ha you're in the process of teaching right now. You cannot, like, just like you said, you, you cannot be that open. But a lot of the guys still, even when they get out, they're like, they, they're trying to protect their coolness. And it's like, you know what, dude, we're, why, why, why? People want to feel like even a green beret or even a, a CAG operator, even a PJ or CCT has vulnerabilities and messes up because then it humanizes us. And it means that they could be us too. And that's what they want to know is like, can I be that guy? Can I make it? It's like, hell yeah, man. You, you don't even know. Like, I'll, let me tell you about how stupid I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so is, is that the whole like FNG Academy thing? You know, like you seem like you're very honest about uh, what being a, a Green Beret was like, um, but also, you know, just overcoming like the first failure or multiple failures is not not the end of the road. That's not your decision point. That doesn't mean that that defines uh, your your who you are moving forward. Is that like, just tell me about like kind of how FNG started and, and is that kind of like your main message or, or what else are you doing and what, what are your goals? That is That is the, that's the primary message. It's like, whether you're military or not, and that's the thing. It doesn't matter if you're military or um, you, you're trying to be a doctor. It doesn't matter if you're trying to, whatever you're trying to do. Some guys just get out of jail and they just want to have a job. You need to under, people need to understand that we fail as human beings. And part of the FNG Academy and what, uh, the message that I'm trying to bring, and especially in the book, is that it's okay to be broken we're all broken human beings. And if you're trying to run this track record of being this perfect person and that you think that only benefit comes to those who have this like amazing life record and these perfect families and um, never did anything wrong, you're, you're sorely mistaken. So if like, 
I've done everything I could to try and prove that I wasn't the white trash, poor kid from feeling California that I could possibly do growing up because I was ignorant to the fact that those, those things that the struggles that I grew up with made me strong. So I tried to run away from it. So I got my education. I, you know, I got associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. Um, I ran marathons because people thought that was impressive. I ran ultra marathons because people thought that was impressive. And what was I, the reason I was, you know, doing all this, it wasn't because I wanted to do this thing. It was because I wanted to prove that I was better than how I grew up. And so I spent all this time running and I got nowhere. And the FNG Academy came about because when I started writing the book, I started to realize that everything that makes me powerful came from all the bad things I went through. And then I started realizing like, that's where the power comes from. That's how we're going to help people. We don't say, hey, do be so great, run, do run marathons and get a master's degree and you'll just be the best. It's like, no, nah, man, look, dig into your past. Like, where was it hard for you? Everyone, it was hard for someone everywhere. Everyone has hardships. Dig into those things and then you're going to find where your strength comes from. Not some, yeah. not some illusion that we're trying to sell to people to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Yeah, let me get a PhD. Let me get a PhD so I could prove to you that I'm smart. It's like I don't care how much education I have. I'm stupid. <laughs> You're the second <laughs> guest that's been getting a PhD for the exact same reason. Um, <laughs> but I think that's important. We, we I, I talk about it with students having that reach back moment into your life. We're like, hey, if I could get past that and still be like a functional human, like there's no reason why I can't do that. Uh, do this right. This next thing and and every wall that you get over uh, makes you a little more confident. To get over the the next wall that's coming your way. Um, so if, if you could just put a bow on it though, you know, I'm 16, 17 year old kid out there thinking about joining uh, special forces or special operations community. What's your, your one big piece of advice? My one advice to you would be the, what you're trying to build is not a resume, it's character. So you do not need to pass selection to have gained from selection. So if you, if you want to do hard things, then you need to do hard things. That doesn't mean that you have to succeed at everything that you do. And so that would be my message to them. If you want to be a hard person, then do hard things. Don't just, don't look yourself in, in the mirror and be like, I need to be a Green Beret or I need to be a, a PJ or a CCT or, you know, a, a Delta operator, CAG, you know, whatever. And say, if, and then if I don't succeed at that thing, then I failed and I'm not that quality of person. You're wrong. The character comes from doing hard things and growing as a human being. So do as many hard things as you possibly can. And that's why I encourage people to do the ultra marathons and things like that, because you're choosing to do hard things that you don't have to do. And it's building your character. And at the end of the day, at the end of our lives, we're going to pride ourselves on our level of character, not our achievements. Like no one's going to sit on their deathbed and be like, but remember that time that I got a, a call off beret and it was tan or green or, you know, or, or maroon. Like, no, no one's going to give a shit. They're going to be like, like, what, how did you affect my life? What did you bring to my life? How, how did I, how deeply did I love you as a human being because of the quality of person that you were? And the way that you achieve that is by constantly putting yourself through hard things when you don't have to. Well, I, yeah, I'm kind of speechless right now. I just like everything that you said right now. I think that's pretty much a sound clip right there. It was super awesome just to hear that said, because that's pretty much the reason why we're doing any of this. It's like, at the end of the day, how can we get our message out? How can we get our experience out? How can we affect the lives of the people that are going to come after us? Because one of these days we're all going to be gone and there's yep. nothing that's going to be left. Like all these material things, obviously they're going to be gone. The people that uh, stick around are going to remember the things that we did and the interactions that we had, how much we were able to care about the person. I actually talked to a dude today that he was, uh, uh, I was an instructor, I was his instructor when he was going through NDOC and he failed. Um, and he ended up going to be a doctor and he graduated top of his class and he's going to go be sauce tea and do all this awesome stuff. And he's like, everything that I learned was because I failed at Indoc and I used those principles from, you know, everything that, you know, you guys taught me, my peers taught me when I was going through Indoc and that team and 
camaraderie. You can't find it anywhere else to be put at that level of fatigue, that level of um, mental state where you're just tired and you have to keep on pushing and get through all those hard things that made me a better person just by going through it. Even though he didn't you know, put on the beret or any of that kind of stuff, you're still successful in all the things that you do because you learn from those experiences, just like you were saying, and you put yourself out there and continuing to grow and you need to be around, continue to be around people that are going to be like that and push you to do that. And you cannot find that in very many other places other than the special operations community, um, especially the kind of people that want to get after it. Like you're talking about go down range and actually affect people's lives. That's why we all join this whole thing in the first place, um, you know, is to actually make an impact on other people's lives and then to prove to ourselves that you like you were talking about, we're not the people that we thought we were when we were growing up and people were like, Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. No way. You're going to go do whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to do it. Watch me. And then, you know, you see them later on you're like, all right, you don't rub it in their face, but like, Oh, you actually did it. Wow. I'm surprised. They're like, yep. And I'm going to keep on doing more awesome mm -hmm. stuff because that's just what I am. And that's what the air force. Well, for me, the air force has taught me being a PJ and all that is just continue to make yourself grow and everything that you do, do it a hundred percent. If you fail, then you learn from it and you keep on pushing on. So, um, like I said, thank you so much for bringing that up. Any last uh, things you want to say? No, I appreciate it, man. I, well, I guess the last thing I would say is if people always like, they listen to special operations guys talk and they, it's like, they don't realize that there's a reason there's a connection there. Like you guys are, I, I didn't do your job. You didn't do my job. We don't know anything about each other, but yeah, we, we literally, know, we literally met tonight. We've exchanged some emails back and forth. Yep. Ops. But we know everything about each other. I know yep. everything about the guys that I'm looking at right now that I need to know because of what special operations puts people through. So if you want to be that part of that brotherhood, and that's what a lot of guys are seeking. That's what I was seeking. It was like that. Another man could look at you in the eyes and be like, I know his character. I know his soul. I know what he's going to do. Well, that's what special operations does for people. You, you we could all, we could, we could have a, a Ranger, a, a Green Beret, a CCT, you know, um, PJ, we could, the gambit CAG, and we could have one big group session and we're all going to be jiving within 30 seconds because we all know each other's salt and we all know each other's character. And I know that the type of person each one is. And if you're looking for that, then you got to step up to the plate and in special, op nothing's going to do that more than a special operations community. 100% agree. Yeah, well so, said. Yeah. I love everything you're talking about and everything that you're doing with the FNG Academy. Super awesome to know that there's other people out there like you, like-minded individuals um, within the same community and really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, uh, you know, talk to all of our listeners and make sure that they're kind of, you know, trying to decide, you know, which, which career path they want to go through, what mission set is the right one for them. And at the end of the day, you know, like we said in other podcasts, no one's going to ever regret the experiences that they've had, whether it's PJ, CCT, Green Berets, Rangers, any of that kind of stuff. We're all grateful for the things that we've been able to experience. So, you know, follow the mission set that you feel is most like what you've seen, or if you've had experiences like Buck did when he was downrange and saw a dude that was like, man, this guy is a freaking God right now in his eyes. And he wants to become that, you know, follow that and continue down the path. There's no saying that you have to stick with any one thing, but the biggest thing that you do have to stick with is making yourself better every single day and making sure that you make those around you as good as you can possibly make them and share the love and make sure that they continue to grow. And in, so in doing that, you'll help yourself grow. So thanks again for coming on. Like we talked about, you know, a little bit about the pipeline, a lot of uh, Buck's experiences going through selection, uh, awesome stories. So, you know, all in all, I really appreciate you coming on and just discussing these things with us because it is, you know, a little bit difficult for some people to just go and be open and honest like you're doing. Make sure you check out his book, when does it release again? Uh, February 23rd. So for that first week too, we're, we're doing a, a deal. So it'll be, um, the downloadable version will be 99 cents. So, you, you know, just to get people, get it in there. So you just get it so you can read it. So February nice. 23rd, if you can jump on it that first week, you get it for 99 cents and you can download it right then and there. Yeah. And, and what's the name, Buck? So February 23rd, what's the book name? It's uh, Rising Above. 
rising above. Good. We'll we'll put it on the reading list as well, man. We'll be happy to put it on the website and to get that word out there. So I appreciate you purchase you it from your website specifically, or is there anywhere else that they can purchase it? Yeah. So SeanBuckRogers.com um, is where is my website. Um, Amazon is um, it'll be on Amazon. That's where you know, went through Scribe Publishing, and and their goal is to you know get as many people as possible, and and you know not focus on um, sales and things like that. It's about as much reach as we can. Um, and it, it, real quick, a huge shout out to Iron Yeti Studios. I I can't thank Stephen enough for everything he does for me, and like these setups right now, like he. I just tell him like, Hey, I'm going to be on this thing. And he just sets up this like professional studio. So I wouldn't be here without him. Fantastic. Any chance you're going to be on audible? <laughs> want to hear your voice reading. Soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think actually, um, Steve is going to record the audible version for me. And if he wasn't, he is now, cause it's being, he's going to set it up. It. It's yeah, out there in the world now. You just spoke it in the truth. Yeah, yeah, it. it's happening. Sorry, That's what brother. I do. I just always listen to that stuff on my run. So awesome. Well, again, I appreciate you coming on. So there you have it. So we're talking about everything special forces. Make sure that you go over and check out his website, check out his book. Um, is there anywhere that any of the listeners can reach you directly or like an email or anything like that? Um, so like more than I should be, I'm heavy on the the Instagram, um, okay. which is Sean Buck Rogers. Um, I answer all the emails I get. Sometimes it takes a while for the questions. As you guys know, candidates have a lot of questions and then one, one question begets uh, 50 more, but I do my best to answer them on there. So. All right. So make sure you guys reach out to him. If you guys have any questions, again, we're here not to only promote any of the aspect war stuff, but all of our other, um, brothers that are working in different branches and stuff and again just to find the right fit for you whatever you feel like go after that and make sure that you do it to your fullest prepare as hard as you can and then get to that point where you can uh, you know go and help others so i appreciate you guys listening make sure you guys like subscribe check out um you know the ones ready.com website there and you can always email us at info ones ready.com or on instagram uh, we're always here for you guys just like uh buck was talking about we're always answering all the emails um, and we're here for you guys. So go out there, train hard, and earn your breath. See you later. Later, thanks.